Welcome, a warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Andreas Bergström and I am Deputy Director here at Forest and at the moment also Acting Director. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words about Forest before we start. Forest is an independent think tank, green and liberal think tank. We work mainly with four policy areas. It's uh, environment, which of course is uh, th this uh, seminar is part of. It's also uh, migration and digital rights and freedoms and economic reforms. And uh, uh, chairing today's seminar is uh, Jakob de Lunde, who is, uh, who is actually heading the digital rights and freedoms program, but uh, is also very active in our environment program. So, uh, well, without further ado, Jakob de Lunde. Thank you, Andreas. At Forest and at our environmental program, we try to create a bridge between the academic world and the political world. We publish studies, reports and papers on viable, effective and market-based policy proposals on how we can uh, solve climate and energy problems. We arrange seminars where we invite experts to enlighten us on complex issues. We recently had a seminar on how the financial markets can better play their part in uh, steering investments into renewables, clean tech and sustainable development. On Tuesday, the 12th of March, we will have uh, a discussion on the issue of shale gas. What will be the environmental impact of increased use of shale gas and what will be the consequence for the global energy market? But for today, the topic is and uh, American energy and climate politics. The US is rapidly increasing its domestic energy production, and even though some of it is green energy, most of it comes from oil, coal, and gas. At the same time, Obama is pushing climate change as a big issue for his second term, giving it precious prime time slot on his recent State of the Union address. And will the unrelenting financial crisis provide the opportunity uh, to introduce a national carbon tax or a cap and trade system solving true two problems at once. To help us, we have a host of ex esteemed uh, guests who will share with us their view on what is going on in, in the great land to the west. We will begin with a brief presentation from Marcus Hanson, who is the energy and climate specialist at the American Embassy. And then we will have a panel of experts who will comment on the issues at hand. After that, we will open up for a broader discussion with questions from the floor. If you want to use our Wi-Fi, it's Fores Seminarium, and uh, the password is Reformer. If you want to tweet about the seminar, please use the hashtag Fores. So let's get going. Uh, Marcus Hansson, you're the Energy and Climate Specialist at the American Embassy. Please share with us your view on the situation. Get the PowerPoint up here. Okay, if I uh, press the button, I'm also up the now. Run on the slide. I think I want the other slide first, though. My my PowerPoint. If we could save this for later, perhaps. Uh, right. I mean uh, PowerPoint. Um, They're done, aren't they? Hmm. That emphasis. There you go. Excellent. Well, first of all, thank you for us for organizing this event and to give me the opportunity to talk about what is a very important issue. 
Um, and it's also one of the priorities of the United States and the Obama administration. I understand I have about 10 to 15 minutes, so I will try to, to uh, be pretty uh, generic. And then if you have specific questions, so I would be happy to address those during uh, the following uh, Q&A session, the panel discussion. I thought it would be useful to first sort of go back in time, see what has happened, where are we today, and then also perhaps speculate a little bit about future trends and uh, what's ahead. The U.S. has done quite a journey lately. Um, last uh, spring, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, came out with the new report saying that U.S. has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions by almost 8% since 2006. The same report said that this is more than any other country in the world or a block of countries. These emissions, they have uh, kept declining and the numbers are now around 10.5 or even 11%, which is the equivalent of 1994 levels. It also means that the U.S. is on track to, to uh, deliver on its international climate targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 17% by 2020. In the last four years, the U.S. has doubled its amount of renewable energy, the so-called renewable energy capacity. That's been done in, in, in four years. Actually, just last month, in the month of January, all new electricity generation installed in the U.S. came from renewable sources, primarily from wind energy, but also from solar and, and uh, biofuels. And also, energy consumption is down, and so is oil consumption as well. So how are these changes actually come about? How, how did this happen? Well, as you may remember, four years back, the U.S. economy was not doing all that well. I'm not saying that it's doing fantastic now, but it was definitely in a worse, in a worse uh, state back then. So Congress and the President, they put forward the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or, or a stimulus package to sort of reinvigorate uh, the U.S. economy, to create jobs and to create growth. The size of the package was $787 billion. $90 billion, that's more than 10%, and that's, by the way, billion with a B, focused on clean energy investments. One of the programs that received funding was the so-called weatherization assistance program. Weatherization is really a fancy word for retrofitting or making existing houses more energy efficient. To date, this program has retrofitted 1 million houses in the U.S., and it sort of had a triple effect. Number one, it has helped the people who need it the most. Anyone here who has been to the U.S. countryside or the rural area might have noticed that some houses are pretty poorly insulated. insulated. Uh, the uh, windows are just leaking energy. And those are the sort of homes that have been in focus. So this helped uh, low-income families and the people that need it the most to reduce their uh, energy bills. On average, during the first year alone, it has saved the average family about $400. Secondly, it has created tens of thousands of jobs because obviously someone has to come to your house and actually do those, do those retrofits. Thirdly, it has re reduced energy consumption and thereby also uh, primarily carbon dioxide emissions. So although many would argue that the weatherization assistance program has been rather successful, it does, still does not account for that much of the U.S. emission reductions. Instead, the new fuel, so-called fuel economy standards have been really critical. What this is essentially, uh, the administration saying how energy efficient new cars and new vehicles in the U.S. need to be. These new standards, they account for about 40 to 50 percent of the U.S. emission reductions. By 2025, your vehicle, you should be able to travel twice as far using the same amount of gas. That's the idea behind it. And this is sort of being phased in until 2025, but it's already had a substantial impact. Thirdly, right now there's a natural gas boom in the United States. Uh, natural gas that were previously not available is now available through a new drilling technique called hydro hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Fr uh, this also, that also means that natural gas is currently replacing coal in U.S. power plants. And on average, natural gas it is uh, emitting 30 to 40 percent less carbon dioxide than coal. So that's had a tremendous impact. And it also means that the price right now on natural gas is pretty low. It's hovering around $3.30, $3.50. i get back to that a little bit later. But it's also 
easy to forget what's, what's happening on the local level. We tend to focus only on the federal level, what the administration is doing or what the Congress is doing. We need to keep in mind that the U.S. Is a federal, has a federal political system, unlike Sweden, for example, which encourages, encourages local action. For example, there are now two cap-and-trade systems in the U.S. First one up in the Northeast. It was launched in 2009, and the auctions have generated uh, revenues that have been used to invest in clean energy and reduced energy consumptions up in the Northeast. It has also reduced carbon emissions and lowered energy bills. And just of January this year, the uh, California announced that they have now also launched such a system. And there are two other such systems in the making in the U.S. right now. Also, many states have something called renewable portfolio standards. These are the, the states setting a limit on or a target on how much of their electricity generation need to come from renewable energy. So that's another way that states are actually at the forefront of these issues. Also, for example, when it comes to transportations, uh, transportation, um, many states are uh, doing everything they can to improve the infrastructure, for, for example, electrical vehicles. There is now a, an electric highway in the making from Oregon to California that's supposed to run all the way up to Washington State that is sort of dotted by electric vehicle charging stations to sort of encourage this development to, to um, a low carbon fleet. Also, the cities are doing quite a lot. Uh, you have cities like Portland, uh, Boulder, Tallahassee, they're all moving forward on this issue. Uh, for example, the mayor of Baltimore uh, was here a couple of, of months, uh, that's actually almost a year ago now, but uh, their solution, or one of their solutions is to, they've increased uh, parking fees in downtown Baltimore, and they're using the revenue from this program to provide free public transportation in the inner city. Pretty smart idea. Also, I should mention that the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA in the U.S., has uh, received unprecedented powers in the last couple of years. Uh, it's easy to forget, you all talk about carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions, but they have put in place new ruling uh, that will make, uh, for example, hydraulic frac fracturing or fracking more, more, uh, more safe. They also put in place uh, uh, new rules regarding sulfur and mercury uh, pollution. Uh, so new power plants or also existing power plants need to install so-called scrubbers to make sure that those pollutants aren't spread in the, uh, in the environment. So where are we heading? I mean, we've talked now a little bit about what's happened, where are we today, uh, but where are we? Uh, you mentioned in, in your uh, opening uh, address that uh, President Obama he mentioned the climate and, and global warming in this State of the Union. In fact, they spent quite a lot of time talking about that issue if you compare it to other issues. Same thing on election night, he mentioned it. And he also talked about it in his inaugura inauguration speech as well. Also worth remembering is that the new Secretary of State, John Kerry, he also uh, talked extensively about this issue in his first speech as well. I was in Washington just two or three weeks ago, and I, I met with colleagues at the Department of Energy State Department, uh, EPA, and I asked them, as I was in town, I thought, I want to see, your, I would like your latest documents on anything related to energy, environment, or climate. The response I got was, we're rewriting all our documents right now. And to better reflect what a priority this is of the administration. So it has been a priority, and I think there's reason to believe that it will be even more so in the, in the coming years. The president has adopted an all of the above approach, um, approach uh, all of the above approach on, on uh, energy, essentially focused on the kinds of energies that the energy that will reduce carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. That include, for example, wind power. That's the wind power production credit in the U.S. that was extended in December last year by Congress. You have solar power. If you want to put solar panels on your house. There's a 30% tax deductible on that. Also, when it comes to biofuels, um, by 2022, uh, the U.S. should produce 36 billion gallons. One gallon is about four liters. You do the math. I'm not very good with math. But produce 36 billion gallons of um, biofuels per year. And a substantial part of that should come from cellulosic alternatives, a sort of uh, pulp and paper industry and, and from, from algae and so forth. There's also reason to believe that the natural gas boom will, will continue. Uh, bear in mind, however, that the price right now is pretty low. 
um, I was at a conference uh, organized by the American Council on Renewable Energy uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, both they and the natural gas industry recognize that the price is very low right now, and there is reason to believe that it will uh, go up slightly to around 4%, which could, of course, to some extent, slow the transition from coal to natural gas. Uh, nuclear is also considered as a viable alternative. Um, as you may know, no new nuclear power plants in the U.S. have been built since the Three Mile, Isle, Three Mile uh, Island accident in the late 70s. But it's now looking into, since, it does not, since nucle nuclear power does not uh, release any, any carbon dioxide. Um, some uh, concrete targets set up by the administration for the next term is still early on, but the uh, president has the goal to double again the amount of renewable energy by 2020, and also to uh, reduce the energy consumption in American homes by 50% by 2020. And of course, the weatherization program here will, will uh, play a critical role. Um, two thing, three more things. Um, I want to just mention before um, we start the Q&A session, um, I just want to mention something called the Swedish American Green Alliance, which is essentially the bilateral agreement between the United States and Sweden on these issues uh, when it comes to clean energy. Um, we have, you know, we meet frequently and we have several programs under SAGA. Uh, feel free to visit our website at SwedishAmericanGreenAlliance.org, SwedishAmericanGreenAlliance.org. Uh, and this year we have a, a program called React US under Saga, where we send uh, five U Swedish university students to five different cities in the United States. Uh, we and the Sustainable Sweden, we pay for it and administrate it. Uh, and it's a three-week program. So it's, uh, if you know anyone or if you're interested in applying, if you, I don't think there are that many university students here, but uh, if you know someone, uh, please uh, uh, tell them to, to sign up for it. Uh, lastly, let's see if I can make this work. Do we have anyone tech, tech savvy here? I just want to show two slides from the International Energy Agency that I think gives an uh, interesting, just sort of spur a discussion, gives an interesting um, picture of um, some trends. Um, so this is essentially uh, showing uh, U.S. oil imports, how they're declining. Uh, U.S. oil imports uh, four years ago. Four years ago, the U.S. imported roughly 65 to 67 percent of all its oil. That number is now down to 40-something. So the U.S. has essentially reduced its, its imports by about a third. And that is largely because of domestic drilling and that is likely to continue. It's um, good for the American economy and it grows jobs. And of course it's good uh, when looking at um, energy dependence, of course, which is very key. Uh, here's another slide sort of showing uh, the change in power generation. Uh, this is once again the IEA's predictions. And it sort of shows that you know coal keeps declining in the US and in the European Union. Um, also, uh, nuclear is uh, on the decline in Europe, and really the future in Europe and, s and the United States are renewables, uh, and also to some extent, of course, uh, gas as well. Uh, just a couple of days ago, Angela Merkel, the uh, German Chancellor, made a statement about her wanting to look into this further, and I also believe that the moratorium on shale gas drilling in Romania just um, they didn't renew that by the end of last year. So. Um, Many countries are, are looking into these issues. I think I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, before we open up for the panel, I have a follow-up question. At the end of um, the climate section in the State of the Union address, uh, Obama made a sort of an ultimatum towards the Congress, uh, asking them to uh, promote a climate package, otherwise he would use executive action. What, what, what is your estimation? What would uh, such a package be, either from Congress or from the administration, and is it a good tactic for him to, use, to do this? Well, first of all, uh, the president has been very clear that uh, very early on that his, his, what he would like to do is he would like to get uh, a bill through Congress, uh, first of all. That's his first 
um, choice. And then, of course, in the State of the Union address, he indicated that if that's not possible, he might look at um, other ways to, to approach the issue. Um, I think there, in general, is, is, um, are some misunderstandings about party politics. Um, I met with some people on the Hill in, in, in Congress, both on the Republican and Democratic side in, in, um, uh, in Congress. And, and there's this perception that you know, they're not talking to each other, nothing is happening, they're not even discussing these issues. That is just not true. Uh, they are talking about these issues on a daily basis. And, um, oh, well. Um, and uh, there's an ongoing discussion. And also historically, this is a truly bipartisan issue that concerned both parties. Um, there was a survey just uh, half a year ago during the presidential election where 12 NGOs, environmental NGOs, uh, WWF, Greenpeace, uh, 360.org and so forth were asked, who was the best president when it comes to energy environment? Who was the greenest president? The number, the four top spots there were two Democrats and two Republicans. Number one, any guesses? Richard Nixon. Yes, Richard Nixon. Are you cheating? You got an iPad. <laughs> Marcus Carson, the notorious cheater. <laughs> Number one was Richard Nixon, um, partly because of the legislation he put forward, but also for founding the EPA. Number two, anyone? Marcus? All right, fair enough. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt, uh, a champion of conservation efforts, also Republican. So two top spots were Republicans. Number three, Jimmy Carter for his conservation efforts. And fourth, President Obama. So it's just interesting to put everything. Sometimes we just focus on here and now, but it's sometimes it's interesting to have a longer perspective on things. Thank you very much. Um, then let's uh, move on to the next stage and invite our panel up. We have uh, Charles Parker, Associate Pro uh, Professor at the Department of Government at Uppsala University. Uh, Matthias De Vool, uh, Energy Policy Officer at Worldwide Fund for Nature. And uh, Marcus Carson, PhD uh, Senior Research Fellow at Stockholm Environment Institutes. And uh, the uh, opening question that I would like you all to comment on, um, is it possible for Obama to have the cake and eat it, to both have um, uh, energy ind independency and uh, effective mitigation action? Uh, Charles? I think Mr. Obama, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a political scientist from Uppsala University, and right now I'm working with the Center for Natural Disaster Risk reduction is one of our interesting uh, topics, so climate change is something I've worked a lot on. Now to your question, I think Mr. Obama thinks this is compatible. Uh, he talked about in the State of the Union starting an energy trust where he would then take some of the proceeds from fossil fuel and then invest that in the clean energy. So I think that's how he sees that as being compatible. Uh, now f for me, I, I think that Mr. Obama can be applauded for doing a lot. I mean, he's a huge improvement over Mr. Bush. Uh, he, he's done quite a little bit. But uh, as you might have noticed, he was very silent for two years, from 2010 to the moment he got reelected on climate change. It almost never passed his lips. He talked a lot about clean tech. He talked uh, about the importance for job and energy security, but not so much about climate change. So what, what I'm looking for the president is for him to exert much more uh, leadership. And to your other question that you asked uh, Marcus earlier about the prospects for tailor-made climate legislation, uh, I, I'm pretty pessimistic. Uh, I think the congressional math does not add up. I don't think we're going to see a carbon tax or a cap-and-trade system in the next four years. Uh, I can come back later to what I think he should do. I have some ideas there. Right. Marcus? Yeah, I mean, I th I, in some ways I think the cake and eat it too question is, uh, is easy. That it, uh, Absolutely, it's possible. Uh, but it's a matter of how the puzzle pieces are put together to make that all fit. And it's also a question of the time frame, whether it happens quickly enough to address the sort of the accelerating changes that we, uh, that we see. Uh, and there are a couple of areas of, of concern that one could point to in, in putting to, uh, together that puzzle. One is the attack on, uh, on the tax breaks for renewables that the Republicans are, are um, 
trying to remove those while at the same time maintaining the tax break for, for fossil fuels. So they're vulnerable in that, I think, because there's a, an inconsistency in the argument uh, in maintaining these uh, tax breaks. Uh, a couple of others that are especially uh, concerning, though, are the, uh, the pipeline issue, which is yet to be decided. Uh, obviously, a really hot political but potato and will be difficult for the administration, whichever way they go on it. Uh, and the, the last one is uh, with the Arctic and the opening up of the, uh, the space up there to uh, exploration and, and uh, uh, pulling up of, uh, of fossil fuels. Um, because the freeing of that ice that, that makes that possible actually you know, gives us a new opportunity to accelerate the process. But um, I would say if you really want to understand how that, those puzzle pieces fall into place, uh, following Marcus's uh, uh, sort of observation is that you don't, you don't get the best picture by just looking at Washington. You really get the picture by looking at that, uh, looking at the whole U.S. and looking across the scales from the national level and all of these different activities down to the to the local scale because it's really the it's the stacking of those blocks that's going to make some kind of congressional legislation possible when it's possible. Yep. Thank you. Matthias, what's your view on the energy policy? Uh, well, I think it's a matter of uh, your perspective, what your ambition wants to be. It's, it's great that the U.S. are doing things, but um, it's, it might not be enough if we look at what we have to achieve. If we have to achieve uh, reductions to go for the uh, two degree target, then switching to gas is not, is not enough. Um, let's say that we switch from switch all the coal and oil to, to gas, we will end up in probably a three and a half, four degree increase. Uh, that's better than six degrees, but not enough. Uh, we need to go to two degrees. So um, switching to gas, uh, whether it's national or, or imported, imported is, is not a good option in the long term. It's not a bridging fuel, which most people think, because you build a lot of infrastructure, which you will get stuck in for a long, t long time. So, um, sure, um, a lot of ambitious things, but we need to go much further than that. Hmm. Uh, Marcus, I also um, thought about what you mentioned earlier regarding fracking. E even though that might mean less uh, CO2 emissions, it causes other envi environmental problems. Uh, w would it be solving one problem but creating another? The, the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency is, is looking at this right now, and then I think they will issue a report later the next year. Uh, but the administration has been really concerned with making sure that it's done this in as an environmental friendly way as possible. There was a ruling by EPA out just last uh, spring addressing some of the issues, uh, especially regarding flaring and what you do with potential methane leakages and so forth. Uh, but I also um, think that some of the... Um, some of the discussion is somewhat um, misplaced as well. Um, f um, for example, when it comes to fracking, I mean, what you do is you drill about you know mile down and then horizontally, and that that would affect groundwater. It it could happen, but it doesn't seem as likely as some people would claim. Uh, I mean, there are there is anecdotal evidence, but um, on a large scale, that does not seem seem likely. Um, but it is something that is, is being looked into right now. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I have serious concerns about fracking as well for, I mean, not least the stories, uh, anecdotal stories about people's wells catching on fire and the methane release and these other issues. But, but I think what's, what's most interesting about fracking uh, and, and to some extent as a bridging fuel is, is how it plays in the change process. And there are two elements of that. One is that it's a much lower threshold move from coal. And the big fight with coal now, uh, there's more electricity being produced with gas now in the US than with coal. The big fight on the horizon with coal is their efforts now to, to transport that excess coal out to the west coast where they can ship it someplace else because they're losing markets. So if you ask the question, who's killing the coal industry? It would be a, it would be a serious political difficulty if it was the Obama industry administration that was labeled as killing the coal industry in part because that's a huge democratic constituency. Uh, on the other hand, if it's if it's the gas industry, gas and oil industry, uh, that's that creates a very different political equation. It creates new problems because you're you are sort of passing on that those revenues to another. 
to another industry that's going to want to hold on to them. But it plays an interesting role in the change process in terms of just strictly, you know, the, uh, retrofitting uh, coal-fired plants, and it plays an interesting role in this political process where it denies revenues to the to the industry fundamentally that was responsible for blocking the cap and trade legislation along with all of its other environmental problems. Thank you, Matthias. Well, I think we need to be very, very careful when we discuss shale gas. I mean, this 30 to 40 percent reduction from switching from coal to gas is natural gas. Shale gas, we don't not know how much it, it emits. Uh, there are studies showing that it emits more than coal extracting the shale gas. So we need to be the extraction, yes because you don't capture the leakage and, and, and so on. Uh, so we need to be very, very careful. And I think going into shale gas is, is a dead end. Charles? I want to say a couple things about uh, natural gas and fracking. And uh, one, uh, the idea that if it's replacing coal, that is a good thing. I mean, that it's about 50% less carbon footprint. But something else, if it's going to crowd out investment in renewables, that's a bad thing. And uh, there's some debate about whether that's happening or not, so that we need to watch that carefully. Secondly, Matthias just alluded to it as these fugitive emissions. And the idea that when you have these fractures in the ground, a lot of methane escapes. So why burning natural gas is much cleaner than coal, if you're, reducing, if you're releasing methane, that's about 70 times more potent than normal CO2. So that, that's an important thing to pay attention to as well. And I think this uh, gets to what I wanted to say about leadership and what Mr. Obama should actually do. And that is one is to use his regulatory power in a number of areas. And one, of course, is to use the EPA to be aggressively used the Clean Air Act. That way he can regulate existing uh, power plants in addition to these new ones. They already have standards for those, but they haven't been implemented yet. <laughs> Secondly is to actually get some better, stronger standards. Uh, Marcus mentioned that they're starting on that, but doing something that actually does resolve some of these questions about uh, groundwater poisoning and the fugitive emissions, I, I think more is needed there. Thirdly, boost energy emission, uh, efficiency. There's been some improvement. He mentioned building see in State of the Union, but there's a whole host of other products they should apply that to. And finally, I think a lot more can be done to limit uh, HFCs, which are extremely potent greenhouse gases and are still very prevalent in the use and refriger refrigeration and cooling in the U.S. There's some more things, but this, those four things, use your regulatory power, don't wait around for Congress. And I should point out also that U.S. Uh, public opinion polls show much more support for regulation than they do for taxes, which everyone hates, Democrat or Republican, and cap and trade, which the opponents have done a good job of demonizing. I don't see any chances for that. So regulation, and I think he should sprint ahead, not just threaten, because he threatened back in Waxman Markey during his first, uh, when he first got elected. Now is no time for threatening. He should just act. He has the power. He should do it. Thank you. Marcus? Let me start by addressing that. Things first, uh, the methane leakage. The, the, um, that is something that was addressed by the EPA uh, last spring. Uh, there was new regulation on that, but it has a three-year phasing period to let the industry actually get the right equipment and 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 to get it right. Um, also, I mean, you have those resources underground, and you have them across the globe and and in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere. I mean, it's going to happen. It's going to be a part of. For example, in, in the U.S.'s case, replace coal, uh, which, as you mentioned, will have uh, reduced the carbon footprint. It's there. The question is, how do you do it in a safe and sound way? How do you do it in an environmental friendly way? That is, it's not a matter of whether we should uh, exploit it or not, because it's going to happen, but it's about making it as environmentally friendly as absolutely possible and take all cons uh, um, concerns into consideration. That is what the administration is looking at now. They've already started regulating on that issue. Given the American culture, one would presume that uh, the public would pr prefer uh, market-based incentives rather th than regulation. What, do, what uh, way forward do you think would be most uh, effective or uh, possible for the administration to go forward? I think uh, also, like mentioned before, I mean, taxes is always um, is hard in the U.S. It always is a challenge. Um, and um, as you also mentioned earlier, the wax and market bill would have 
put in place a, a, a federal or national cap and trade system in the U.S., uh, but now it's all instead happening on the local level with California and, and through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative up in the Northeast. It is not quite as ambitious as the, as the one in the EU, but it has already had uh, an impact. Um, so I think we're going to see more happening on the, on the local level than on the federal level. Hmm. Charles? You mentioned California, and I'm from California. I wanted to take a, a moment to offer that as a glimmer of hope for action on the local level. And also as an example of leadership. Uh, a lot of things have happened in my lifetime that I haven't expected. Uh, one of them was Arnold Schwarzenegger being elected governor of my home state. <laughs> now Jerry Brown, I didn't expect that either. He was governor when I was a very small child. <laughs> governor Moonbeam is back. And uh, in a glimmer of hope, you all know that this Waxman Markey cap and trade on the national level didn't get passed. But California has this Assembly Bill 32, Global, Oceans, Global Warming Solutions Act. And actually there was an attempt in the 2010 election to suspend that in a way that it almost would not would have been put back into place had it happened. And the voters of California actually voted to keep that legislation in place. And I think that is a glimmer of hope. And it also showed that Silicon Valley and the clean tech industry was an alliance against the dirty uh, polluting industries like the Koch brothers and others who were funding the effort to suspend this. And uh, Marcus mentioned the cap and trade system has gone into effect. They actually had the first auction in November. So I think that bears watching. That will be very interesting. And it's supposedly supposed to be in the future part of this Western Climate Initiative. A lot of states and Canadian provinces have gotten cold feet. But Quebec is supposedly going to put its own cap and trade system online. We'll be connecting that up, hopefully, with California in the future. So there's some interesting innovations going on in these local and state laboratories. And I think that bears watching and makes me a bit optimistic about some chances for politics. Regarding the American uh, opinion and, and uh, having these polls, um, should uh, Obama have, have more leadership and, and talk about these issues more to, um, to promote the issues and, and change the, uh, the opinions rather than waiting for others to, to move forward? You're asking throwing that out to everybody? <laughs> should he talk about it more? That would say he should act more. Yeah. I, I, I mean, this is a tricky question. If you look at the polling, and it touches a little bit on American culture, uh, one of the, so, the, so let me start with that. Uh, one of the things about American culture is it's not one thing. Uh, you know, it's a country of 360 million people. The regions are enormously different, and any of you who've traveled there uh, are, are very aware of the differences between the East and West Coast and Texas and Louisiana, where I spent a decade. Uh, and one of the things you find is that the, uh, the characteristics that actually are measured in some of the better polling tend to stack on top of one another. So the areas where, where people are uh, dismissive of climate change as a problem are also areas where people, uh, where people are quite conservative. They supported Republicans in 2008. They, uh, they don't want the U.S. to sign on to any agreements that have a ceding sovereignty. Uh, they distrust science. They do trust generals, um, and th they go to church a lot. So, I mean, there are a number of different factors that stack on top of each other to make certain regions of the U.S. places where you really can't expect to see much positive going on. Good chunks of the South, for example. But there are other areas, the West Coast, the East Coast, where the Reggie, where the cap-and-trade system is running already, where, where you see the reverse happening. There are really hot spots for activity, innovation around renewables, but also public opinion tends to support policy processes that can set in place regulations that eventually uh, feed into some sort of national kinds of policy. So uh, this is all a very long way of saying it's unclear that Obama has enough trust as a scientist to be able to go out there and lead the charge by, you know, and, and they've been, you could argue that, that they had, that they followed a, a unsuccessful, you know, ineffective strategy over the last four years. But I think it's for different reasons than how much he talked about climate change publicly. If, if you make a comparison to, to gun laws, it's, uh, it's obvious that Obama and the administ administration is trying to lead uh, and, and trying to change the conversation and making more, uh, changing the, 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 uh, the, the opinions. And, yeah. and um, he hasn't done so much in, in climate change uh, doing that. Yeah, I think that's a longer conversation, actually. <laughs> um, and, and I would say that um, 
uh, I mean, this, this, number one, the gun issue came up as a result of a series of events capped by an especially horrible event. Uh, but you see something similar with the uh, hurricane hitting New York right in the, la you know, the run-up end of the election, and climate change sort of popped up onto the, not just Obama talking about it in the convention and in the State of the Union speech, but it's, it's back on the agenda. And that combined with a number, you know, nine severe weather events in one year, it actually has shifted public opinion a little bit. People look around and, you know, droughts in Texas, uh, hurricanes on the East Coast, th th those have an impact on the discussion. They open up space uh, to, to have that discussion. Charles. I would say that it was very encouraging that he mentioned the climate change so prominently. And it didn't come out mm -hmm. as it was mentioned so much in the last two years, but he mentioned it once when he got the nomination. He mentioned it more prominently when he got elected. And then he mentioned it more prominently in his inauguration address, and then he went on at some length in the State of the Union. And there I thought he was very good about making the links to climate dangers. And that was very good. But he was much less clear and ambiguous about what he was going to do about it. And there I think he should be clearer, and I think he should actually act. He has his agenda set in power, and that's a rhetorical thing of talking about it. Making the case to the American public, very important. Using the bully pulpit that is the presidency. But also his regulatory power, which is to do something. Now, to link this to the polls in the US, they're quite interesting. Uh, and there's a number of them. You can look at uh, the Gallup. They'll be doing their poll they always do on the environment in March. So you should see some results from that. Uh, you have the Brookings Institute poll. You have these two fellows at Stanford, at the Woods Institute. And there's some variations, but basically they find that most Americans do believe that global warming is real. But then what you see is big differences in party between Republicans sure. and Democrats. And that is whether this is man-made or natural, and then two, whether we should do anything about it, with Democrats being much more supportive of that it's uh, man-made and that something should be done about it. Um, but. There is support for the majority of Americans of doing something. I already mentioned before that they're actually more comfortably, bizarrely enough, with regulation rather than market-based schemes like cap and trade. And just added to just what you were saying, there was a poll that came out just a couple of days ago, less than a week ago, showing that about 65 to 70 percent of Americans want the president to act on climate change in the next four years. Uh, I think about 30 percent wanted it this year, and then another. Uh, uh, the rest wanted it within at least his term. So, uh, but once again, great variations around the U.S. Uh, just mm -hmm. like in Europe, I mean, you have uh, some countries are really in the vanguard of of these issues, while others are uh, are not. So, and uh, the same is the case in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We sometimes forget that the U.S. is is uh, 50 states. Uh, it's hard to sometimes to look at it as a country, but I think uh, that's something we 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 need to do. And once again, I don't think. The president now with a clear mandate after the election, I mean, I think he um, feels really comfortable speaking about the is issues which we d then saw in the State of the Union and so forth. So I don't think he could have mentioned it more prominently than he did. And the same thing goes for, for uh, Secretary of State John Kerry in his first address as well. I'm going to give the word to Matthias and then, then I'm going to up and up for questions from the floor and we will have a microphone for you. Matthias? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, need, we definitely need action, but action on, on governmental level is difficult in any, any country. So I think that we need to focus more on the, on the local level to look at cities, for instance. Absolutely. Cities are very progressive and, and very soon half of the population on, on Earth will live in cities. And cities can do a lot. And I think that's where we need to focus more than trying to get... <laughs> Nas on national level decisions t to get the action that we need. We agree. I couldn't agree more. That's one of the things that we do um, real work on under the Swedish American Alliance. The, by the partnership with Sweden is that we brought over, I think, three delegations of U.S. mayors to Sweden to meet with Swedish counterparts, Kommunal Road mayors, to sort of have sharing of best practices. We so we've also had uh, Swedish mayors over in, in Washington in the U.S. as well to really have, you know, get this dialogue going to exchange best practices. So it's extremely important. Thank you very much. Does the audience have any uh, questions or issues that they want to raise? We Otherwise haven't no, sparked I, I, any questions. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the future for the Keystone XL. Um, do you have any uh, comment on what Obama is going to do? Uh, it, it is a sensitive issue, and, and uh, no ruling is expected uh, before April. The um, 
administration has announced, uh, and um, uh, but environmental concerns are front and center. That's something that John Kerry said um, when he was um, um, in, in his first address. So that's the information I have right now. On that. It seemed like the American um, uh, environment movement seemed uh, uh, felt it was a great success in, in blocking it uh, last yeah. year. But the question if, if they can sus sustain it and uh, keep it in, uh, in the uh, agenda and the discussion. Yes? Yeah, I wonder if I, uh, I would like to build on this point about local uh, governments just on a couple of uh, areas because it's relevant to what's happening here as well. And that is that, I mean, if you look at the change process in the U.S., that, that uh, federal legislation of this sort of sweeping scope that, that cap and trade or a tax system would have, it's typically happen when, when you're over a certain threshold of states, uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of the states. And we're actually fairly close to that on a whole range of different kinds of regulatory structures. Uh, but what happens in the states is based on what happens locally. And frankly, it whatever gets done at the global level in terms of signing international agreements it still has to be implemented locally and that's where we've really seen a lot of effort a lot of progress and still a lot of difficulty in moving these mitigation efforts uh, there has been a proliferation of efforts to, to actually get traction at the local level and you see them around Stockholm you see them across the US other places in Europe and I would argue that if we want to free up space for for the global negotiations to move forward that that the the place to to put that energy right now uh, where there's a, it's a complete win-win proposition is is at the local level where where these efforts are being made to to do everything from retrofitting to changing the way we move ourselves around to changing the way we consume energy. Thank you. Now I have a question. Please introduce yourself and uh, have the question briefly. Thanks, Jakob. My name is Rob Watt. I'm Director of Communications at uh, SEI, so I work closely with Marcus. Um, I, I wondered, we, we focus quite a lot on, on domestic policy, domestic politics, and uh, that's very interesting, but one of the slides that Marcus showed was from the IEA, and it talks about the growing energy independence, um, and I'd like one of you, all of you, to, to draw a line a little bit from what that scenario might have in terms of the international consequences for energy markets and climate action on an international level and how that might then play back into the domestic uh, politics of energy and climate. Yes. I don't know if I can answer that exactly, but uh, one thing that's kind of interesting uh, about this link between what people do nationally and then globally are, are the goals. So if we look at what uh, the EU, for example, wants to do, and the European Commission released this uh, roadmap for a low-carbon future, and we're talking about going down by 80% uh, carbon by 2050, and that's going to be a, a, hard, a hard push to do, especially when the easy things are done. Uh, I was at one of the climate summit meetings, and I believe it was the Cancun one, where they had a number of EU energy ministers. And the one, the fellow from the UK, he talked about his holy trinity of getting there. And that was renewables, nuclear, and carbon capture and storage. And if you actually look at the International Energy Agency, when they talk about how are we going to achieve the carbon reductions we need, the decarbonization of our economies and our societies, they're, they're putting enormous uh, hopes in carbon capture and storage. And uh, we're still yet to see this working. Uh, I would like to see some industrial level demonstration plans. And, and so there needs to be a lot done if we're going to reach these really ambitious goals science says we need to reach in a short time window. So let's see if technology can save us. But I always say the proof is in the Proof of the pudding is in the eating. Matthias? Well, well, I think I think it's uh, that picture is is quite depressive. Uh, even though it looks at e exports and imports, it is an increase in, in use of fossil fuels, and uh, and it doesn't matter where it's it's uh, emitted. Uh, and I think we need to start to rephrase our questions, asking: Is that actually what we want? We don't want that. It doesn't matter if it's domestic or, or important. We need to reduce the use of fossil fuels. And, and it, it's a very complex system where you have cheap gas in one place and then uh, cheap coal in another. And, and the thing is that we cannot use any of it. There's no replacing of fossils with fossils. We need to get rid of it all. 
Marcus and then Marcus. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you think about, I mean, if there is a sort of a holy grail politics, it's energy. It's energy to burn and, and food energy, right? Uh, and uh, you don't have to look back very far to see how disruptive it is when energy prices go through the roof and, and everything else gets uh, gets shaken up. So it's not surprising that uh, that you know the developed countries on the planet from the US to China are scrambling after some kind of internal, some kind of national level control over their energy sources as a first priority. But obviously if we figure out how to do this with renewables, there's no more, ren there's no more secure source of energy than capturing you know, wind, sun, energy that comes from the water uh, without all the, the side effects. But, but it's, you know, th there's a process to get there. And the question is how do we minimize the damage, I think, on, on the way to those those kinds of renewables, even the European Union was built on locking up, you know, energy and uh, energy sources uh, in uh, some sort of a collective governance system as a way of avoiding future problems. Uh, it, you know, it's not all bad to think about how how we globally might be able to to move toward a system where we have energy security based on taking advantage of the sunshine that lands on our. Uh, you know, on the shores and and uh, the the winds blowing, but uh, but it the process of getting from here to there is is a, a tricky one to navigate, and there are obviously actors in the way that would like to slow that down as much as they can, because every additional day of delay means additional revenue. Marcus, and that's when the smart grid systems become so important that you know, for example, in the southwestern U.S. where you have a lot of of sun and therefore solar power, um, but when the sun is not shining, you're still going to need electricity, right? That is important that you, you're able to, to uh, take that electricity from, for example, the northeastern U.S. where the wind is, is blowing so that you connect all this into one grid. Um, that is uh, extremely yep. important, and that's to your point earlier. Uh, also, I just want to mention, we tend to forget, we always talk about UNFCCC, which is, of course, an extremely important uh, avenue and venue, but we should also remember the other four us out there. Uh, for example, uh, you have the MEF, but also uh, another initiative that was launched just a, a year ago called the CCAC, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Uh, Sweden and the U.S. are among the founding members there, and it's addressing sort of everything that is not carbon dioxide, focusing on methane, uh, soot, uh, and other ar important particles that make up <coughs> about 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions. So. Uh, we, we should also remember those avenues as, as, as well. This is something I want to mention. Regarding the, 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 su the summits within the uh, UN framework, um, the U US hasn't really been the most constructive and progressive uh, um, force within these summits. Is there any possibility for, for, for changing the, uh, the tone and also building more trust towards the developing world? I uh, would like to challenge that premise, actually. I don't agree with that. I think the U.S. has been uh, a constructive uh, uh, partner and, and, and led big parts of, of the work. I mean, the U.S. was early to, to, uh, to uh, get behind a, a green fund, uh, for example, for developing countries. The U.S. has uh, donated significant amounts of money for, uh, on financing to help developing countries. So um, I'm not sure I, I, I quite agree with that, that premise. I think the U.S. has been a, a constructive partner in, in several ways. Charles? I was going to have a little perspective there. I mean, I've been doing a lot of research at these climate summits, and if you go back, I think a lot of the perception of the U.S. is negative in their role international <coughs> negotiations goes back to the Bush administration, because Bush said he wasn't going to participate any longer in the Kyoto Protocol, and basically spent eight years on the sidelines. And then, of course, leadership recognition, which is something that I've been doing survey work on, uh, going back to Bali uh, shows that it was very low uh, during the Bush administration, but it shot up during when Obama became president. But it's been leveling off a little bit since then, so there's been a little bit of a perception that because he can't deliver domestically that the U.S. is not the most uh, effective leader. Uh, but the U.S., though, has definitely returned actively to the international negotiations with an active diplomacy. And I think that matters a lot. And they do definitely represent a constituency of participants in the UN. Now, this is something that's going to be interesting going forward. If you've been paying attention to the negotiations, what they agreed to in Cancun and cleared the way for this year in Doha is trying to negotiate a new global agreement that they're going to finish by 2015, which will then enter into force in 2020. Now, here's where the three different, most important countries have very different visions of what that should look like. So the EU, you have China, you have the U.S. And the U.S. wants much more of a bottom-up 
pledge and review voluntary type goal. The EU wants much more binding, top-down targets and timetable. And China, of course, has very strong opinions that it is the rich, developed countries that should do things aggressively and pay for the developing countries to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So how are we going to square those three different visions in the next couple of years, get really aggressive international action? Uh, it will be interesting to watch that process unfold. So uh, that, that's basically what's happening now. And I think the U.S. will play an important role. And I would say that Copenhagen, while it was a disappointment from the, U, the EU point of view, I think it was an important step forward. Uh, the, the pledges that people put on the table, if they deliver on them, they're meaningful. It takes about two-thirds of the where we need to go. Can on that point? Yeah, sure. Uh, just, uh, I mean, just, just what you said. I mean, getting 194 countries to agree on anything is going to be hard. Uh, but for the first time, we now have all countries, all major players actually have commitments on, on paper for the first time ever. So that is sort of a paradigm shift in itself. All the major players, China and India, are on board as well. So that is, uh, but that does not mean that all developing countries have to do as much, uh, the same stuff. Of course, it doesn't make sense that China and Chad are doing the same amount. That has never been the US position, although that is sometimes, you sometimes find that out there. There's something called differentiation where uh, you know, you have to expect different much from different countries, but all major uh, all major countries are now on board, and that is a positive step in the right direction. Then also, the green fund, as we mentioned earlier, is another uh, big step forward. So, um, I think, although not perfect, uh, there are certain deliveries under the UNF UNF Triple C framework, and it's a very important uh, avenue to 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 use. I guess. Yeah, I I think. You know, I don't think there's anybody in this room, not likely to be anybody in this room, who wouldn't like to see the U.S. take a much more, uh, much stronger leadership position in pushing this issue. And and the uh, the evidence suggests that it that it needs to that we need to accelerate the pace of change on these questions. But I, I think the the point that's not sufficiently appreciated is is that that leadership position is tightly coupled to what's happening in the U.S. This was announced from the very beginning when Obama said that he was going to he was going to keep his position close to where Congress was and wasn't going to outrun them the way the Clinton administration did because that's not a successful strategy. It gets a treaty that looks good but that the U.S. doesn't sign on to. So, however frustrated we are with, uh, with the slow progress that we're making and with the potential for a stronger leader po leadership position that the U.S. has but has not been able to really f realize, uh, it is very tightly coupled with what's happening in the U.S. and the political polarization there has, has made that much more difficult, although it's starting to break up. I mean, we saw a little bit of a shift in this last election with even a Republican senator who acknowledges climate change being elected. That suggests not only that there are conversations sort of in the hallways where the danger of being challenged by a Tea Party-backed uh, candidate uh, is, is sort of waked, but, uh, but also that, that the, the sort of uh, universal uh, what, uh, defeat <laughs> of uh, Republican candidates who acknowledge climate change and say we need to do something about it is, is, is losing a bit of its traction. How far that goes is, is another question. But the, the key point here is that these things are coupled. They, and then they cannot be uncoupled. And if we want to see the U.S. take a stronger leadership position, then we should figure out ways to, to uh, connect with cities and states and look at experiments like California that if that's successful in the face of a, a real economic struggle right now, that provides evidence to the rest of the country that will help accelerate the process sort of on the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you. We are coming to the uh, end of our seminar. I'm going to give uh, Matthias the word to comment on this issue, and after that I'm going to give you the opportunity to make uh, a projection on what good things that might happen and what needs to be done in order for this to happen. Uh, Matthias? No, just, a, just a quick comment. It's, it's very easy for us to, to blame the US and blame China for not doing enough. I think we should start blaming EU for not being a role model and taking the lead, which we actually have the we have a better opportunity to do mm -hmm. that. And that might act, uh, act as, an, as a role model for U.S. <laughs> easier to make progress in that country as well. Um, well, yeah. So, Charles, do you want to begin uh, with the ending and give us s some uh, perspective on wh what good things might happen? Well, I mean, I think if you look ahead, I mean, the, the future is always cloudy. So, I mean, I see some uh, building blocks that give me reasons for optimism. I mentioned California already. 
Uh, I think the endangerment finding by the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and the fact that Obama has regulatory power and I, I think public opinion polls uh, give me some glimmers of hope. I think there's some stumbling blocks as well and I think we really need to find a way to put a price on fossil fuels which is what's going to drive the shift to the clean energy we already have and provide the impetus for the innovation that we need for the future. Uh, so I, I see both the you know, some prospects for hope, but also uh, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it. I mean, it's going to be difficult, and there are uh, very different interest groups at play here, and that's why uh, political scientists, I mean, Aristotle said politics was the master science because everything has to happen in a political context, and we need a political system to provide the correct incentives to achieve the goals that science says we need to achieve. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, I'm going to sort of go with my discipline of sociology and, and say that, uh, that if you under, want to understand politics, you need to understand the change process that happens beneath the politics that supports it. It's the, it's the part of the iceberg that's underwater that, uh, that you don't notice if you're looking for these legislative sort of swings, uh, swings that happen. And I think there's a lot moving, not least in the European Union. Um, Jean Monnet said, uh, the, one of the parents of the EU said that if you want to change things, you, you uh, follow the path of least resistance. And that doesn't suggest that you don't take fights, but it does suggest that, that each step restructures the chessboard for the next step. And we ought to be pursuing those easy steps as fast and hard as we can because it changes changes the dynamic out there for taking the next one as it creates new easier steps. That's the way that these uh, these big legislative sweeps uh, are most likely to happen in places like the U.S. It's the way that I think we're likely to get to, to more much more comprehensive and, and uh, successful agreements at the global level. Um, so, so it's the there's a, probably a nice way of phrasing this, but it's uh, sort of act globally, act locally, and negotiate globally. It's it's a combination of all the small things, and it really can't be underestimated. And in fact, it's what got us into this problem in the first place. It's all of our little emissions contributions that are creating it. So, so we need to attack it from the on the same basis. Thank you, Matthias. Well, this is a very difficult thing uh, to make this, uh, all the things that have to be, be done. Uh, we have a, about five, four or five years before it's, it's too late. And when I say too late, it's, it's more than two degrees increase in, in global temperature. Um, it's not, not a lot of time, but we, mm -hmm. we can still do s a lot. Last but not least, Marcus. I think there's uh, reason to be optimistic. I think the U.S. is on a, on a good trajectory right now, and, and the fact that uh, the press and other administration officials have, have, uh, uh, are speaking so much on the topic are all very positive indicators. Uh, and also, I mean, working within the U.S. government, see the flurry and, and see everything, um, uh, the result of, of those speeches. I mean, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm I think there's reason to be positive, optimistic. Thank you very much. And this discussion will continue at our event on the 12th of March, where we'll, we'll discuss shale gas. But uh, I want to thank Charles, Marcus, Matthias, and uh, Marcus for uh, taking your time and sharing your perspectives and, and your knowledge and putting up with my English. And thank you all for coming here. <laughs>